Welcome, everybody. This is the U.S. Grace Force Podcast. I'm Doug Berry, along with my very good friend, Father Richard Heilman. And tonight we've got Monsignor Pope is with us once again. Yeah. It's been a long time. We've got him back finally. This is exciting. Okay, <laughs> awesome. You. And what a subject we're going to be talking about, the ultimate trial. And this is out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 675, a trial mm -hmm. that will shake the faith of many. And we're going to break that down and actually look more deeply into whether or not that could be going on right now. Yes. But of course, everything begins with prayer. So Father Heilman, we always leave that to you. All right. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you very much, Father. And we want to thank all of you out there, as we always do at the beginning of the podcast. Anybody and everybody who supports the U.S. Grace Force podcast with your prayers, your encouragement, your financial support, all is very, very helpful. And we can't thank you enough. You're always in our prayers. I want to make a special heartfelt plea to anybody out there who might be interested in supporting us financially. Uh, the times being difficult as they are for many and the cancel culture being as it is has mm -hmm. definitely crept into our financial support as well. There are some people who've had to back out for various reasons. And some of that, I think, is good, probably due to some of the cancel culture and those who just aren't crazy about the way messages are being are being shared and conveyed these days. But we want to stay true to that, and we're going to. And your help has everything to do with that. So your prayers are of the utmost importance. But those of you who want to support us financially through the Patreon program, you can click the link in the description below. That will be a tremendous help because there are always those pieces of the puzzle that need to be dealt with. Bills need to be paid. Lights need to be you know, turned on and, and all that goes with it. So we thank you so much for your financial support. Again, click the link in the description for Patreon and we ask you to pray about it. And if you can help us out, we thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Also, don't be afraid to go out to the U.S. Grace Force gear page. The link in the description gets you out there to get t-shirts and other Catholic paraphernalia, I like to call it, that helps get the message out. And again, in these times, this ultimate trial time, possibly that we're in right now, and I, I kind of think that's where we are, it's really good to get this message out to as many people as possible. And this is a fun, simple way to do it with things like t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, and all of that. So check that out. Again, the link in the description for the U.S. Grace Force gear page. Uh, Monsignor Pope, good to have you back with us. Father Heilman, I know this is uh, something we've been uh, kicking around a bit here, and I'm going to let you bring in our guest, and let's break this down and get into this ultimate trial conversation. Yes, thank you, Monsignor, for being with us. Um, you've been, uh, one, of, one of the many ways that we've been connecting, but is is that every year we get tens of thousands of people together, and we do what's called a 5040 Novena for Our Nation. And uh, I'm going to say it this time, probably five more times, but you can go to usgraceforce.com to find all the information about that and also to sign up. But anyways, uh, for 54 days, this is a very powerful novena. I've come to understand that throughout my priesthood now, and I've seen miracles, many miracles. But mm -hmm. to get tens of thousands of people together from around the nation and even around the world together praying this 54-day rosary novena, you can Google it, too, and get the history. We're not going to go into it right now, but it's it's pretty fascinating. And then what we do is we go from August 15th, the Feast of the Assumption, uh, and that it happens to be exactly 54 days to October 7th, the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, Our Lady of Victory. And then we what we do is we ask everybody on that day to get together, and we pick the 3 o'clock hour. We just pick Central Time for that. But that we're all praying everywhere and that uh, people get uh, groups of people and we, we actually push that they do it outside, you know, kind of, kind of praying for the land. You know, it says 2 Chronicles 7, 14, God, please heal our land, right? And um, and so everybody around the nation, that's called Rosary Coast to Coast. Okay, mm -hmm. there's actually a web website for that too. Uh, you can Google that. But but then the uh, we call it the anchor for all that is in our nation's capital, in Washington, D.C., and that's Monsignor where you and I have been, and Doug, too, uh, we've all been there, yeah. um, for the last number of years now. Um, and uh, Bishop Coffey's been able to join us. He can't make it this year either. Uh, but we're, we're going to have Sister Didi there. She's been joining us the last few years. Might remember her from uh, the Republican Convention. It was just awesome. But anyways, <laughs> uh, uh, so we're, we're going to have uh, we're going to have everybody join. We're going to be right on 
the grounds of our nation's capital, but we're, we're going to be processing our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, and we're joining um, the uh, uh, Men's March this year. So we're going to meet up at the Supreme Court. This is so cool. And we're going to be we're going to be processing with them, and uh, and a big a big part of our petition too is life. It has to do with life. Uh, a lot of it has to do with hope. Here's our petition. Okay, mm-hmm. may uh, may the church and the country find hope as we unite at the foot of the cross. And I'm going to actually make T-shirts. I'm actually working on it right now. Big unite across the front and then underneath at the foot of the cross because we're getting accused, aren't we, Monsignor, of being divisive you know because we're bringing the truth of the gospel what is the will of god and if we dare do that we're called divisive even within our own on our own team i like to call it but even with among ourselves and we're 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 we're, um we're being told you know don't say anything don't get anybody upset don't Mm -hmm. give the truth and so monsieur can you give us kind of your perspective of what's going on right now i mean it's. It, I. I. I was just saying this to a couple of people the other day. I said, "Can evil get more evil?" Yeah. That was what's going on in our time. What's your kind of take on what's going on? Well, I, I think that if we were to maybe put it into a couple of phrases, we'd have to say that there's a false Messiah that's yes. being presented to us, uh, a false gospel. You know, Jesus, the real Messiah, said, "I have come uh, not for peace, but for division, for the right. sword." Uh, to divide one against another. Now, it's not division for division's sake, but as St. Paul says elsewhere, I think in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, he says, look, there, in a certain sense, there have to be divisions among you to show who is approved. Right. You know, there are going to be those who reject Christ, and there are going to be those who accept him. Simeon right. held the infant child Jesus in his arms, and he said, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel. Right. And a sign that will be contradictory. Contradiction, yeah. So this idea can't be all... Yeah, the sign yes. of contradiction. Yeah, exactly. go ahead, brother. No, I just to, to maybe say, in other words, there's going to be, um, you know, conflict regarding him. We, we right. just can't we all just get along? It's a it's a fake gospel. Now, it is. we don't intentionally look to go out and make conflicts, but if we preach the gospel. It is going to be conflict, and um, there are going to be some who say, "None plot yet." I don't, I don't approve of it, and um, I don't want to get your rosaries off my ro- ovaries and get your Bible out of my bedroom, and you know all the stuff we yeah. have today. So I think all we could do is go and preach the gospel and accept the fact that Jesus said there are some who are going to hate you. Um, now we don't look to be hated, but and we don't intentionally use incendiary language, but we have to use clear language that sin right. is sin. And this is very averse to lots of, but Jesus was nice. But if you really read the real Jesus, he wasn't nice. Right. He was a prophet. And, you know, there's an old saying, you know, that good sermons afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. So, and we're all a little bit of both. And Jesus was that way too. Like any good prophet, he will console the, or comfort the afflicted, but he'll also afflict the comfortable. And we're all sort of in both categories. And this idea that we should just sort of make nice and, you know, th- this is a fake gospel, a fake Jesus. They, they want to reduce him to a harmless hippie uh, who was just nice and approving and welcomed everybody. He welcomed them so he could say to them, now repent and believe the good news. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's kind of funny. You, you mentioned that about being nice. I just looked up, you know, what nice means. I mean, the oh, typical oh, definition oh, is agreeable, pleasant, satisfactory, but it turns out it says that that nice began as a negative term derived from mm-hmm. the Latin necius. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know. It means not, not, unaware, not very bright. Yeah. It means unaware or ignorant. Yeah. All right. And, <laughs> um, the early 1300s. Not flattering. Uh, it's not flattering, no. Um, first borrowed by, from the French in the early 1300s. And for almost a century, nice was used to characterize a stupid, ignorant, or foolish person. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, the idea that, that we want to be nice and get along, it, it doesn't say much for us if that's the goal. Yeah. Uh, it, it is it is crazy. Um, now, Monsignor, you're out in the D.C. area. Uh, mm-hmm. Fathers of Wisconsin. I'm in Texas. Um, I don't want to... I don't want to make a judgment on which state I think is probably the most patriotic, but we won't go there. Uh, but here in Texas, but anyway, uh, what's, what's the, what's the climate out there with regards? I mean, you got a political issue. We're not going to get political. Of course, we don't do that. 
so much here, but um, the right wrong aspect of policies, you're in the thick of it. You're in that area that's really the, the seat of government for the country. Yeah. Um, where do you see things going in our country in particular uh, with regards to policies that are coming out of government that are yeah. moral issues predominantly? Because, you know, yeah. people say, well, we don't want to get political. Look, there are certain issues that you simply can't avoid. They're, they're issues of right yeah. or wrong. It's a moral issue. Yeah. Right. Government policies are being formed around mm -hmm. and about and affect mm -hmm. deeply. Um, your take yeah. on what's been happening in our country uh, morally based on some of these government policies that we're seeing? Well, it, it's very clear that um, our, our government uh, in general, under really both parties, but it's, but it's, it's been a, it's been a particular problem more on the left, but nevertheless, there, there's, there's not, there's very disappointing zeal from the, from the right wing or the Republican party as well. But we have a, um, a, a very tragic alignment and the devil's no idiot. He knows how to divide us politically. So he's parked what we would call the kind of um, non-negotiable issues on one in one place and the more negotiable issues on another. Now, what do we mean by negotiable? Well, negotiable doesn't here just mean, you know, um, there can be no arguments. It, it does that, but only indirectly. What it means is that, you know, you're either for again, abortion or against it. You're either for gay marriage or you're against it. You know, there's not a lot of middle ground. Now, when it so those are what we call non-negotiable things. And the devil has largely parked those in the Republican Party. But there's other issues where, as Catholics, we're concerned, but they're negotiable in the sense that, like, for example, care of the poor. Okay, we all agree that that's, we're not ever to hate the poor, but the question is how best to care for them. So nobody's saying, well, let's hate the poor and just heck with them and, they're, 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 you know, no, nobody's saying that. But the question, the debates there are more negotiable things. How do we, big government programs or more subsidiarity based state programs or church based, you know, so or, or how do we um, deal with immigration? You know, what's the numbers? What are the percentages? Uh, how much how many do we welcome? What do we do with those who are here illegally? There are prudential issues that are very reasonable people will differ, but you're either for abortion or against it. So right. what you end up with is, is a very puzzling landscape for most Catholics who maybe they are concerned about immigrants or maybe they are concerned about questions of dealing with the poor. But my gosh, in order to, uh, th there's this sort of thinking that somehow one party takes care of that and the other party takes care of things like abortion, and they, they're forced to choose. But I, I would largely argue that um, the devil is no idiot, and he has very masterfully set us against each other politically. And the saddest thing I want to say, Doug, of all is this, that most people are more passionate about their political views than their religious ones. Mm. And you will just get people to shut down immediately if they are from one party and you're talking about abortion or another party and you're talking about immigration, they're just going to shut down. Mm -hmm. And it's, I call all Catholics to say, would you please try your very best to be Catholic in these things mm -hmm. and express Catholic things. But it's, it's, I'm living in the deep blue sea. And unfortunately, the government has taken an extremely hostile thing. I think we talk a little bit about the deep state. And, you know, party, you know, presidents come and go, Republican Congresses and Democrat Congresses come and go. Uh, my brothers, the State Department is always there. The Commerce Department, the, you know, you, what you name it, Department. And, and they're very populated with, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this guy, this too shall pass. So this Republican president says, we're going to we sweep in with these policies. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's on my inbox. I'll get to it eventually. Mm. You know, there's a very sort of slothful, stubborn, uh, deep inertia in, in the in the real runners of this government who are the what, what some people call the deep state. But I would say are basically those who are ensconced in these career um, political appointments and positions in, in state departments and government agencies who really kind of run the show. I have a little sign in my office, by the way, just to show you. <laughs> it says, do you want to talk to the man in charge or the woman who knows what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my only point in that is that, you know, pastors come and go. 
But there are going to be these staff people who kind of know what's really going on. Right. My only point is, and I don't mean that for bad things in the church, but I'm going to say to you that there is a very stubborn inertia in the federal government here now that is definitely aligned with the left. I don't even mean liberals now. I mean the left, mm -hmm. the hard left. And they've been drifting that way for a long, long time, for some 60 to 70 years. Right. And it's become hardened, and you will go up against them and just be nothing but frustrated. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I agree with you, Monsignor, obviously. and But I keep saying that this... Uh, insurgents, I'll call it what you just described, mm -hmm. uh, was allowed because yeah. we remain silent. Uh, exactly. our, our spiritual leaders remain silent yeah. through all that time. And and uh, the title of, of our podcast is The Ultimate Trial That Will Shake the Faith of Many. And uh, Monsignor, we were talking beforehand, and you, you re referenced Catechism 675, and 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 I went, oh my goodness, my bishop just wrote an article on that mm -hmm. in our diocesan newspaper, and yeah. I referenced it in a uh, recent homily that I gave, uh, right. but and that's where it where ultimately comes from, but it is on Catechism 70, 675, and I'm actually reading from his article, he says, um, an intriguing paragraph in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which I have often pondered, is 675, and it goes like this, the church's ultimate trial before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution which accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an, uh, an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. It goes on a little bit after that, yeah. but... Um, that's what we're passing through. And God bless my bishop, Bishop Donald Hying, uh, for calling mm -hmm. it out. And I get accused of coming after or, you know, poking at, you know, bishops. And my big thing is, where are you? Why aren't you shouting from the rooftops? Why are you allowing this iniquity, this apostasy mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. just have an easy time of it mm -hmm. while... You're saying basically nothing, and I, I'm and I'm going to get back now to the the petition for the 54 day Rosary Novena. May the church and the country find hope as we unite at the foot of the cross. Okay, mm -hmm. not any compromised position at the place where we are in love with the Lord and we're and we're following God's will as exactly how He wants us to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you say that, you're dangerous in, mm -hmm. in the present climate, and you're divisive. Oh, right, and, right. and we're not divisive. Unite at the foot of the cross. But they think that unity will be found while mm -hmm. we give away abortion or we give away gay marriage or we give away contraception or whatever. Then, then at that other place over there, we can maybe find unity. I don't know. Monsignor, uh, it, and now, now we're facing... This synod on synodality, and <laughs> it's it, it, it's it, evil is having an easy time of it, wouldn't you say, Monsignor? I do. Yeah, you know, I want to just say to back up something you just said. Sure. Look, the world and the devil will never be satisfied until every last ounce of our integrity and faith is gone, and we belong totally to them. Yep. You, you, you say, well, we'll compromise here. Well, for example, I just give you a quick example. Uh, many people say, "Well, come on, you be you do you, I'll do me." You know, if you want to be gay married, fine. Just just don't bother me with it. Fine, fine, fine. Well, that's not that's not enough. You have to celebrate it. And if you won't celebrate it, uh, I, I'll bake me a cake, you bigot. Yeah. So much yeah. for tolerance, right? Yeah. You, you yeah. will bake a cake for me, you bigot, or I will see you in court, or you will yeah. photograph do photography at my. You know, and and it's never going to be enough until right. you're in the gay pride parade or the what the abortion rights parade or whatever yeah. they want to. It's never, never. I promise you, it will never be enough. Compromise until you are completely compromised at every level and no longer have the faith. So and it, again, it just please, seems like please, those who hear this, the spiritual leaders who are compromising are the ones getting rewarded. Yes, and the ones that are saying no, you can't compromise yes. with the with the will of God are the yes. ones that are going. Oh, 
you're dangerous. Oh, you're one of those rigids, right? Yeah. You're right. traditional people mm -hmm. that's causing all the problems. Right. Uh, didn't the, the Pope j just said something uh, in a recent uh, interview, yeah. uh, something to that like that, you know, the, the, the traditional, the, the people yeah. that are, right. that are strong, that, that are staying true yeah. to the will of God are the problem. Yeah. Right. That's where we are right now. Yeah. And I don't, we don't feel the love from the Pope that he tells us that we have to show. We have to welcome everybody, but apparently we are an exception. You know, we're, we're like, well, but what about us? We, you know, all we ask, we're not asking for the moon. We're asking for the church that had always proclaimed the truth. Right. Faithfully. Now, we haven't always lived it faithfully. There have been troubles in the history of the church. But at the end of the day, we have a, a, a body of teaching that has been faithfully handed on for 2,000 years. And all we ask is that this be upheld and defended and that we we not simply be excoriated for saying, well, you know, you, you say that we should go over here and bless a gay marriage or we should go over here and say abortion is okay. But that is not what the, what the church and the scriptures teach and right. we and we're called all kinds of names for that you know you can do anything you want in the church today according to some people except say a latin mass or um ask for the um the actual uh, doctrines of the church to be upheld you are you know so and it's very very asymmetrical and extremely frustrating to so many catholics including me, and I, I've had it up to here with that. And yeah. all this talk about welcoming and synodality and stuff, it isn't, it doesn't mean us. We're not included. Yeah. And Monsignor, I, I find that very sad. Yeah, Monsignor, I'm curious. We talk about this. I got several questions I wanted to hit you with or, and just mm -hmm. we can all talk about here. But um, the ultimate trial that will, will shake the faith of many, the fact that that's in the catechism, yeah. Um, and we're not putting dates on anything with for anybody. And and this is something we want to be very, very clear about. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not talking about the second coming of Jesus and such, and we we have no idea. But there are those voices out there, and I this is just posed as question and conversation piece here for us, um, who say that October, at the time we record this, early August, um, something might happen, convergence. I'm not ascribing to this, I'm I'm not. I'm not subscribing, I should say, to this necessarily. There are so-called alleged prophecies about October being a month of convergence. Many things could happen, might happen. Um, I'm always more concerned about, you know, what's going to come out tomorrow. I mean, a couple days ago, 11 Russian and Chinese warships in a military exercise sailed incredibly close to Alaska, and four <laughs> U.S. destroyers were sent to intervene and guide them away from Alaska. Those types of things are going on regularly now, whether it yeah. seems threat of World War III or whether it seems, you know, the government's going to come in and start going after Second Amendment rights on another level. Uh, and, and and it goes on with all the different uh, transgender issues and everything that are being, you know, forced upon our, our kids in school as young as kindergarten. This These things are happening all the time. Now yeah. I see this kind of slow roll that's picking up speed, and I'd like yeah. your your comment on the the trial that will shake many is already I believe going on it to some degree. Mm. And I just believe, yeah. and I think a lot of people do too, and I like your thoughts on this as well. Do you think this is going to pick up speed, pick up cadence, mm -hmm. get harder? What might that look like? And to the to the to our audience out there who's listening or watching, what? Yes. What should we do? Because I, I, I mean, I, this is getting harder and harder, more confusing. You turn your head, you're trying to find good voices out there and trying to find voices that will just simply be strong enough yeah. to not buckle under the pressure. There's a lot right there for you to unpack for us, Monsignor. Well, you know, in Catechism 675, it says that this, this, um, this trial would be in the form of a religious deception. Yeah. Listen to those words a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. Oh, okay, so we're divided in the church about uh, gay marriage or abortion or uh, women priest or physician-assisted suicide. And the apparent solution is, well, let's just kind of forget all that stuff. It's not that important. Let's all just get along and, you know, let's all just sing kumbaya. That is a religious deception that sacrifices the truth and, and accepts apostasy. We cannot, cannot, cannot go along with these things. 
um, uh, without surrendering the faith. Mm. And so you and I have a decision to make. Um, will I just go with the flow? Even because, and frankly, and tragically, God has permitted at this time that some of our highest re ranking religious leaders would defer, would fall into this trap and, and, be, and be issuing to us edicts that we should start blessing sodomy, gay unions. I mean, you know, let's, let's be honest. Now, if they were chased even then, but I mean, it's not a, it's not something we're in the business of blessing. All right, but we, we we're to be blessing these things. We're to be uh, accepting, uh, you know, uh, you know these these kinds of unions and so on, or that we should start doing women priests and all these things that go against the clear teachings of the church and um, uh, high-ranking officials, entire bishop conferences, like in Germany, are saying this, and people are like, very. Some people are confused. I'm going to say to you, my good people, don't be confused. Go to Ludwig Ott, go to the Catechism, read what the faith is, and see that they are defecting, they are apostatizing, they are committing heresies, they are leaving the faith, they are redefining the faith. And I'm not here to say they by all name. Over again. What's that? 1517 all over again. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, I'm not here to name names. And, but I, they I, nail it on a, on a door, you know, what they want. Yeah. yeah. It's very clear. And I think we have got to understand do not be deceived. Right. And we are we are in a, in a passage right now where there is a grave deception that has come upon many, even in the church, even many high-ranking officials, not all. And I, I, I want Catholics to you know find good holy bishops and priests who are articulating the truth, cling to them, pray for them, pray us through this. Look, there have been times in the church when we had three popes. There have been times in the church where all the bishops, almost all the bishops, were in in a kind of a heresy against uh, the, the, the the divinity of Christ. It took just a few bishops, like Athanasius and and Nicholas and a few others, to just win the day. And 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 the only we, we, we so we've not, we've been here before. This is not to say you know form your own church and leave. No, we've got to stay here, pray the church out of this terrible calamity that we're in. And uh, not lose heart. And again, the rosary that you were mentioning, Father, earlier. I got my, I got my rosary here, my bullet rosary. I don't know if you can nice. see the bullets there. Uh, um, Twenty-two cows. Nice. <laughs> People are offended by this, but I'm telling you, right, we're at war, and this, the rosary is the weapon of our times. I know. You take this rosary and you pray for our church, pray for our bishops, pray for radical conversions, pray for priests, pray for deacons, mean, pray for parents, yeah. pray, pray, pray. We're at war, we're at war, and we've got to wake up and stop being so quiet and, oh, we need to be nice and not hurt anybody's yeah. feelings. Listen, they don't care about hurting our feelings. Uh, uh, Monsieur, I'm so tired because you're, you're helping me remember that Atlantic article that came out. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and there were bishops that were like, well, we should stop using militaristic language, you know? And I was like, ah, you know, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Okay, let's get rid of that prayer, you know? Uh, get rid of Revelation and basically, 12 already, the, the whole yeah. tradition of our church <laughs> that is about spiritual combat yeah. with Satan and his uh, his minions. Um, no, we shouldn't talk militaristic language. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my bishop with this article because what you were talking about, too, is it's it's happening in the church. I'm going to do another quote for you here. He says, this desire to redefine moral reality has now found a voice within the church herself. Yeah. As some individuals, certain theologians, but even some bishops and priests, wow, mm -hmm. bishop. You know, I had a priest friend uh, email me after you read this, and he said, your bishop is going to be in trouble. Because yeah. that's where we're at right now. But, he, but you know, just go on. Even some bishops and priests advocate for fundamental shifts in Catholic teaching regarding the acceptance of contraception, homosexual activity, transgenderism, transgenderism and even including puberty blockers and surgery mm. for minors and euthanasia. Oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, yeah. and, and either they're advocating for it, and here's the other thing that's, to me, equally as frustrating, uh, it's too mild of a word, mm -hmm. but uh, they're silent. Okay, you mentioned the German bishops and whoever else. 
Yeah. Where are they coming out? You've got Bishop Strickland, who's on the hot seat right now. Yeah. And my bishop used to have to come out recently here. Name as many as, as three more of all the bishops, you know? They're just, they're just not saying anything. And here's why. Because you will be demoted. You will be canceled if you dare speak up. You will be rewarded if you get in league with what I just said there. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's where we're at right now. And so, so a bishop has to make a personal decision. Am I looking for personal reward in this current church? You know, and so am I either silent or advocating these uh, worldly uh, 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 atrocities? Uh, yeah. Or, you know, do I speak up? And uh, I, again, I'm proud of my yeah. bishop. But gosh, he just did what I've been doing, and I've been crucified for it for yeah. the last couple of years right. for doing yeah. what he just did anyway so it's, it's again, all of us are going to have to answer to christ one day and yep. i think by gosh you better think about that everyone better think about that you know do you are you worthy of jesus christ are you just worthy of the world you know and, and you know we, we've got a decision to make and Somewhere in this, all the bishops, all the priests have to finally say, one day I'm going to stand before God. And we all know that that passage from Ezekiel. He says, look, son of man, I made you a watchman for the house of Israel. And I'm telling you right now, I've sent you to warn him of his sins. If I send you to a wicked man to warn him of his sins and you don't warn him, he's going to die. But I'm holding you responsible. Yeah, that's it. And you're going to answer, especially those of us who have been called, who have been named to be watchmen for the house yes. of Israel. Who, when we see the wolf coming, he says, and that's the wolf. Yeah. Oh, let's welcome Brother Wolf. Come on, all are welcome. Yeah, Brother all are wolf, welcome. We don't want to offend you. the wolves. Yeah. 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 And again, not to be in, intentionally hostile to people, but I just tell you, well, let me just tell you a quick story about five years ago when this whole trans, well, three years ago, actually more, when this whole transgenderism thing started to just come out of nowhere. Right. And if you didn't instantly get woke, you were just completely out to lunch. I got up and I said, my people, I love you too much to lie to you. There are not 50 genders. Right. There are two sexes. And God made us male and female. And that's what the scripture says. And anything opposed to the scripture is a lie. Yeah. Well, anyway, three or four people got up and just walked out on me. Right. Yeah. Yep. I said to my, when I was a younger priest, I said to myself, I would have been, oh, my God, I'm going to get a letter to the bishop. I'm going to die. I was worried. I said, but then I said to myself, now that I'm a little older, not to be smug or arrogant, no. uh, but I, I do want to say to myself, maybe that's the wolf going out. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to drive some wolves out. Yeah. And I'm not. And my intention is to drive anybody away. But if if somebody does not want to hold to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, yeah. through Him and through His apostles. I, I, I don't know that I, I need to have them in my congregation yeah. infecting other people, you know, yeah. especially if they're going to be outspoken. And if yeah. they want to get up and walk out, I mean, that's on there. I never tell yeah, But you'll get accused of being divisive. No, yeah. we're uniting, we're uniting at the foot of the cross. That's yeah. where we're uniting. Yeah. yeah. Come on, come on. I always love the story of the prodigal son. The father saw him on the distance, meaning it was hoping he'd come home someday, but yeah. he had to come to his senses. And he had to come home, and he could not bring the prostitutes with him, okay? Amen. He had to come home and follow the house <laughs> rules, okay? Make it plain, Father. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then the father ran out tearfully and hugged him. You're home. You're back. That's what the church is. We want you home. We want you united. But you can't bring the prostitutes with you, okay? Amen. Amen. Yeah. 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 Well, senior, now, for, for those of us, I'll throw in the, the laity angle here. That husbands, fathers in particular, heads of families, um, what message do you have to them in this this time of trial? And it is an ultimate trial. And I I, I see this kind of how it's unfolded, especially over recent years. Yeah, um, we've been we've been forced into kind of the the the, the corralling that they do with animals to yeah. accept certain things. And this yeah. isn't going to stop. I mean, when you hear yeah. people from the World Economic Forum, people out there, the so-called elites, the self, mm -hmm. self-imposed, self they yeah. make themselves elites by their position yeah. of power and money and such. Mm -hmm. 
And they start telling us, oh, no, eventually it's going to be obligatory, mandatory. You will this and you will that. And then we're going to control this. And now they're talking about central banks and so forth. And and, and the money is going to be controlled. They can shut you down just like, you know, what happened to the truckers up in Canada at the protests, you know, going after people's financial uh, scenarios and such. Sure. So with all of that, the average individual like myself, you know, husband, father, grandfather, you know, we've got decisions to make. Yeah. whether or not we're going to go along with these worldly views, these worldly directions right. yeah. and agree and get, fall into the ESG scores, you know, so that we're, we're favorably <laughs> looked upon by, by some of the corrupt church leaders, as well as government leaders. Mm -hmm. um, what, I mean, where do we as laity uh, kind of fall into this? Because to me, this is all part of this ultimate trial. We're, in fact, a news story I saw earlier today, there's more and more talk about putting a chip in the hand to to connect you to a central bank idea. Yeah. Now, whether they go that far with it or not, they wouldn't even have to do that if they decide just to digitize money and then just turn it off or on how they choose to based on yeah, right, whether right. you've spent too much money on meat, for example, you've bought too many rounds of ammunition, you've bought too much gasoline, your take on those pieces of what appears to be part of this ultimate trial that will yeah. that that is already forcing people into um into a lot of like you know corralled positions of boy do i do this or do i risk losing my job the canceling of the average layman out there for not taking an injection we'll put it that way so we don't get taken down because of censorship um your thoughts on how we lay people sitting in the pews have to respond to all of this. Well, you know, I think that uh, maybe to start by saying that there's a lot of criticism, rightfully so, about silent pulpits where priests are not speaking publicly with their people about these complex, but also very clear moral issues of our yeah. time. Now, this is a great scandal, but it's also, it's not just pulpits that are silent. It's dining room tables at fa in family homes. Yeah, it's, it's living rooms where these things... It, look, um, I, I'm going to tell you a funny story. It, it, years ago, this is back in the late 60s now, uh, my, my brother and sister and I were watching a uh, Flintstones cartoon. Hmm. And Dad at some point came in and he turned it off. And he said, I don't want you watching that. And I'm like, what's wrong? He said, I do not want my kids watching a steady diet of adults looking foolish. That is not going to help you to respect your elders. This is not the mind of God. All right. And this is not how adults behave. And it, now the Flintstones, I mean, good heavens, you know, to most of us, that's like mild. It's yeah. nothing close to the Simpsons or family, you know, whatever these family look, uh, steady diet of these things. And parents and other educators and all have just let kids just consume this stuff mm -hmm. at liberty. And then we were surprised that they have no respect for their elders, no respect for tradition. They're bold towards their elders and teachers. They have no respect for the teachings that are given to us from antiquity. Well, again, so again, I think that if you want, it's very easy for all of us to sit here and criticize bishops and priests and the Pope or what have you. And rightfully, the many criticisms are very worthy of the target. Mm -hmm, sure. But it is also, you know, well, let me put this when I go to when I go to the Lord to complain, he says, Carlito, he calls me Carlito. <laughs> a little Charlie. <laughs> he doesn't call me Monsignor, I can assure you. Says, Carlito, look, I've given you a parish. I've given you people. I've given you some internet ministry. I, I want you to go. I want you to bring people to the faith. I want you to keep doing the work I've asked you to do. I want you to work the part of the vineyard that I gave you. All right. Now, if you're a parent, if you're a young parent, have lots of, pardon the expression, lots of good biblical marital sex, lots of children, <laughs> and raise them Catholic and set them loose. Yeah, This is yeah. how we're going to change the world. But raise them Catholic. Be, be careful. Don't have a television. Don't have this internet. You you be very careful what those kids watch until they're well into their, you know, you know later years. Uh, my, my brother and sister-in-law have nine kids. And uh, no television. There's no television in that house. Um, no, they, they don't have free access to the internet. That's just not going on. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a family media room where they watch certain movies and things and so on. But at the end of the day, that is not. There is no internet access in that house for those kids. I have another brother. Now those kids are older now, but as I say, 
And they've been careful too about what those what those those kids watch. My other brother and sister in law. But I'm gonna tell you right now, too often we're just ready to wag our finger, but many parents don't want to get in don't want to get into these conversations mm. with, with their children and grandchildren, uh, with their nieces and nephews, with their siblings. Oh, well, I don't want to upset them, you know. And uh, you know, you got a sibling who's not going to church, you know, and it's oh the bishops this, oh the pope that. But what about you? What have you done to go to your brother and sister and say, I'm, I'm concerned that you might go to hell if you don't repent. You're living with your boyfriend, your girlfriend. You're um, you're not going to church. I mean, do you think you can be saved? How can you, how can you avoid go, being sentenced to hell? Now, maybe you don't have to use that harsh language right away, but has, has anybody ever gotten to these politicians that said to them, you know, you can go to hell for this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna almost guarantee you, because politicians are surrounded by sycophants, that nobody's ever sat them down and said, you could go to hell for this. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what do we say that to our own children or grandchildren when they're doing serious things? Yeah. You know, and but I follow boldness, but, but love, but boldness, get in right. there and preach that gospel. And there's going to be tension. Okay. And go ahead. No, no, Monsignor, I just want to echo what you said, that the conversations are not being had consistently and clearly enough in the living rooms, in the dining rooms, yeah. you know, uh, really monitoring things, but also instructing and teaching and explaining. And when I hear parents who will say, you know, well, I put the foot down here or there, it, it, there has to be instruction involved in it. It's not just, yeah, you're right. hey, you're doing this because I said so. Like yeah, I, yeah, I raised yeah. five kids. I could have easily just said, hey, this is the way it's going to be because I said so. Yeah. I always wanted to talk with them and train them and teach them and then give them the understanding that they have the free will. They're going to reach a point when they all move out and they all have three of my kids have now gotten married and had their own kids. And so I'm a grandfather now. And what I said to them, I still remind them periodically that you have the free will, but I taught you and trained you in what you knew, what, what you should know is right and wrong. And then from there, of course, this is now on you. I will still continue to try to be that hopeful you know wise voice if i can i pray for that grace to do that but i would also say from sitting in the pews i agree with you also i want to hear my pastors i want to hear my priests say to me these are difficult issues don't just talk about something that's a church history only related to today help me understand how these things apply today yeah because there's a lot of parents i think that are sitting in the pews and they're getting kind of the, the flavored cupcake of the week type of homily. In fact, I heard, a, I heard a woman put it that way once. It's like different flavored cupcakes every week. But I, I want to know, what, how should we view things that are happening in the world through the lens of Catholicism? Right. And once a week, I need that you know, 10, 15, whatever minute inspiration in yeah. that homily. Um, so I just want to echo that, what you just said, Monsignor, because I do think that it's a, it's a big deal. We've got to be doing it in the homes all the time. You know, even when my kids and grandkids come over, I still need to have my home be a place that is a refuge mm -hmm. that has that sense of decency and order and, and faithfulness to it. But in addition to that, boy, do we need to hear it from the pulpit. We need yeah. to be hearing, like you said, those complex issues that we're all facing right now. Yeah, we need to model it. We do. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think a lot of parents struggle because we don't model it. Uh, in the pews or in other settings like catechetical settings and so on, enough. And um, it's all kind of these bromides and just yeah. jargon. And but it, it's it's going you know abstractions and generalities. And mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, to tackle the moral issues and say, now look, this is what the Lord says. And you're either going to go with what the Lord says, or you're going to be in error. Yeah. You know, you're going to be in sin. So I, I don't want to dominate the conversation much more, except to say. I do think that even if unfortunately, and it is sadly unfortunately common for many people, that your parish, your pastors, your priests, your bishops aren't going to be as helpful as they ought to be, that doesn't, you've got to go ahead and just grab your own resources and go to work. Mm -hmm. You know, at yeah, some exactly. level, yeah. you've got to be the yeah. chief educators. And I, I say that with sadness. We should be leading, but you can't wait forever for the church to get our act together. We unfortunately don't. We have the problems that we have in typical large corporations. That mm -hmm. There's all this yes men at the top and everyone's running around sort of pleasing everybody else. And, and, and meanwhile, the good, the good faithful are being lost. So I, I, we can wait forever. But like I say, the Lord says to me, 
Carlito, I gave you a parish. I gave you a vineyard. Now, cut it out. Stop blaming your bishop and everything else. You, I'll deal with that. That's above your pay grade. You go to work. You do what I gave you to do. Mm -hmm. Use the tools, and by God, don't wait for somebody else to come and do it. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, and I'll just throw the, I'll just throw this in real quick. Excuse me for Alhamdulillah, but I'll throw this in as a father. I had to pick up the catechism and learn it. I had to pick up certain things and learn it. Partly because I couldn't expect the pastor to do all the teaching necessarily. In yeah. you know, in a homily once a week, or even if I went every day, if I went to daily, no, those those are things that that need to, you need to be saturated in, and that just takes time, and I need to be responsible for that myself. Yeah. I, I, but I'll go back to I, I and, and I know you've said this already, and I know Father Heilman, you're you're this way, is we need to be inspired by, motivated, and reminded by our shepherds that we do have a responsibility in our homes to be forming those homes as the husband, the father, the wife, the mother, head of the house, heart of the house, head of the heart of the family, the home, that yeah. they, they got to work together for that family to be a place of order and peace. Yes. And and I, I, I want that inspiration and, and reminder from my shepherd, but I know that you're right, Muncie, you know, that is on me. It's on these shoulders right here to be to be responsible in picking up those books, those yeah. teachings, that rosary, all of those types of things. Um, oh, that was funny. We should have seen that on camera. The tail just went across the front of the screen. It looked like a snake. <laughs> I, mean. I thought you had a pet snake. Yeah, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. But in Father Hamlin, I know that's you. I've heard enough of your homilies. You do that. And this isn't to flatter you. But, um, you know, you you have always, every time I've heard you preach, you've always been that reminder to the congregation and, and whoever's listening that they have a responsibility as well yeah, yeah. to Absolutely. pick that up and, and, and make that. But here's what, I, here's what I've been saying all along is that we always talk about, okay, we've gone through a, an era of poor catechesis. And I say, okay, I, I get that. I agree with that. But you know what the greater problem was? We went through an era of no hunger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and here's why. And here's why. And I, I'm going to take you on a little quick journey. I hope it'll take me a minute or two. But um, th this uh, last uh, August 5th was the Feast of the Dedication of the Basilica of St. Mary Major. Why do I bring that up? Because the uh, statue in there, uh, uh, Regina Pacis, Our Lady Queen of Peace, is my favorite in the whole world. It also happens to be Father Calloway's. It's such my favorite that it actually ended up on the challenge coin for the United States Grace Force. Okay, there it is. Um, but you know what happened? In 2019, that was the day that the Pew Research Report came out saying 70% of Catholics think that's a cracker on the altar. It is not our Lord Jesus Christ. And very little was done with that. And, and Monsignor... Uh, two months later, almost to the day on October 6th, the vigil of Our Lady of the Rosary, what happened? The, we, we witnessed what looked like the worshiping of a pagan idol in the very heart of the church, St. Peter's Basilica, on that day. It, it, was, it was on that day as, as well that, um, that reports came that on October 7th to October 23rd or whatever it was, there was no cell phone activity in the Wuhan lab, meaning something happened on October 6th. On that day, Sister Agnes Sisagawa receives another message, not since 1973, Roe v. Wade year, had she received a message, and, she, and it was just simply this, mm -hmm. put on ashes and pray a repentant rosary. So here we are, and this is a moment, okay? We're saying, are we facing the ultimate trial, all right? And then look what happened. Then all of a sudden, it was you were fine to go get a bong to smoke pot, but you couldn't receive our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity in, in our church. All right? We face what, what's going on, and here's where I'm going with this, is that we have been decimated, okay, by the devil over the last 100 years of Satan. Mm -hmm. And But what did he do primarily? He took away our belief in the supernatural power of God. And what? And, and I'm going to close with this. This past week, last Thursday, we got the reading of the cloud of glory coming on the tent with Moses, right? Mm -hmm. And then we just celebrated the transfiguration on Sunday, the cloud of glory that came over uh, Peter, James, and John, right? 
Monsignor, I believe that our primary mission as priests is to get people in that cloud of glory, okay? It might not be a little cloud. By the way, I was driving uh, up to Madison on that Thursday that reading came up, and I literally drove into a cloud while I was driving. <laughs> but oh, <okay>. anyways, <laughs> but I think God was trying to emphasize something. But it, we, we call it, it, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the glory of his presence, okay? Yeah, and that's what we strip. And right now, you, I'm serving with a priest that can't offer the trad traditional Latin Mass because he was ordained too late. I mean, here's where we are. That that no cloud of glory for you, okay? And 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 uh, oh, you know, no odd orientum, and you know, let's not push too much about communion on the tongue, and and uh, you know, let's ah, uh, uh, you know, what I'm saying, Monsieur. Yeah, yeah. I think we're in the place we are right now because <laughs> people have been uh, subjected to a secular version of religion over all these years and the, so there's no experience of the of the glory of God's presence that goes mm -hmm. I want to know more of you I want to I'm hungering I want to I'm going to look it up I'm going to do that I do that I know you guys do that too you're researching you want to know God more you know because you've experienced the uh, the glory of his presence but mm -hmm. but the vast majority of not 70 percent and we and and our response is to Worship a pagan idol in the heart of a church? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I just, I've about had it. And then if we dare say anything, we're canceled. That's where we're at right now. But, but see, what, what do you think about what I just said? Well, you know, I think that we have discovered something. You know, when I was ordained in 1989, so 34 years ago. I was 88. Yeah. You know, there were, po there were a few reports that came out at that time that showed about 17% of Catholics understood the true presence. The rest didn't. Uh, so what did we do? Well, we taught, we taught, we taught. I mean, I've been teaching, hammering away at the Eucharist now for 34 years in the pulpit. And all I can say is that the needle hasn't moved much. Now, why would that make? Well, I think part of it is because it isn't just what we say. It's how we behave and act in our liturgies. Right. Um, Basically, right now, I think the way most people behave in the typical Catholic parish, including the clergy, is there's nothing special here. Welcome one and all. Have a nice yeah. day. You know, people wearing baseball caps and right. halters and shorts. And it's, it's you know, you know, it, it, there's not much attention to the ceremony or detail. Yeah. Now, Father, you have shown very beautifully that you can do the new mass. In a very beautiful way. It's not just, well, the new mass. You know, I believe I'm doing it like how Sacra Sanctum Concilium said you should do it. Imagine, you know. All, all the other stuff was added afterward by the yeah. bulk liturgists, sure. you know, post Vatican II. Uh, am I yeah. right or wrong about that, Monsignor? No, you're right. And I think uh -huh. everything that you did is permitted. And it's what really, if you read Sacra Sanctum Concilium, and don't look at all these later things that came out in 65, right. 67. Oh, after the yeah, uh, you, you, you did everything. And the idea here is that so let's not just turn this into, oh, you hate Vatican II. Stop that. I don't. No, I don't either. Yeah. It's, it's not about that. But there's no. I, I, I hate the spirit of Vatican II. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, right. the way they use this, the, well, it's not in Vatican II, but it's the spirit of Vatican II. But go ahead, yeah, man, whatever I want it to be. Yeah, whatever I want it to be, because the spirit yeah. of Vatican II, yeah. Well, anyway, but, the point simply being is that, so let's not get into those debates, but let's say this at least, that we people learn more from the way we behave and the way we act than what we say. Oh, Jesus is truly present, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and about the only place you'll experience it in the most parishes is during Eucharistic adoration. Right. Uh, mass itself is rather a chaotic, noisy, yeah. sort of busy affair where God is... You know what I don't of, like, Monsieur? I don't like the sign of peace. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because, okay, we're about to receive Jesus of the consecration app, and we're going to come forward and receive body, blood, soul, and the virginity of Jesus. Right. Hi, Bob. Hi, Sue. How are you doing, Jane? Good to see you. Good oh, give me a high five. Yeah, yeah, hi. Are you kidding me? Go, go team, go team. Yeah. <laughs> but listen, I think, I think, so I think, Father, you're, you're right. And, and less that we, you know, we just want to emphasize that this is, many priests are prevented.
from putting things into place. If they try to put an altar rail back or they try to even just give options. Like, so for example, I started putting a kneeler back at one of my masses saying, if you want to kneel, please feel free. And about half the congregation does. And it's growing. I, I think though that if I were to tell that downtown, they'd say, oh, you know, this is not. Yeah. No, I'm not saying they would. I'm just saying that uh, I, I've asked the bishops collectively in many of the articles I've written in the register, would you let priests use a little pastoral sensibility and maybe make some of these more traditional forms available again, like ad orientum or kneeling or communion on the tongue? That are all the, caught the in sacrosanctum contilium. You know, right. It, yeah. Exactly. And so, but very often, the priests who try to do that do get push pushback. Now, I would caution my brother priest: don't run off and just turn all your masses instantly. I'm here, and we're going to do all. I know. But maybe make a mass out. available, and you'll see it grow. It'll grow on its own because right. God's good people have a proper sensibility. It's all this stuff that comes from on high from the liturgy workshops and things that they get imposed on them and uh, but god's good people have ultimately pretty good sense about this and so i'm convinced that if we were to allow more of it that it would it would grow the traditional stuff i mean and it doesn't have to be the old latin mass it can be like you do the new latin mass beautifully celebrated and you know it, it's, it's not we don't have to get into that big battle except to simply say that you know it's sad today that the only ones who aren't accompanied, who aren't included in synodality, whose voices are not allowed, it are ours. You know, where we say, well, you know, oh, well, you're you're you have mental health issues. You must be rigid. That's a mental health <laughs> problem. Um, you're trying to dogmatize. You there's something wrong with you. Well, but you know, we're going to welcome everybody else who wants to change dogma. Right. And all we want to do is live the faith as it was lived for many, 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 many Absolutely. centuries, even millennia. And and, and well, again, boil it all down. Boil yeah. it all down. All what we want is for, for people to have the to enter the cloud of glory. I, I'm yeah. using that as an image. But yeah. we want people to get to that place yeah. where they've experienced the awe and wonder of God. I, I'm Monsignor. Everybody listening is going to hear, hear that. I've said this a million times. But Pope Gregory the Great ordered the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He put on one or fear of the Lord first. Yeah. And that means if you're going to get the power of the Holy Spirit, you got to go through one to get to two yeah. through seven. And I, I just believe that. And the church right, was yeah. always effective. You go into these glorious church, churches and you open that door and your voice goes like this, mm. you know, because you know you're being predisposed to remember the power that God is present in that place. That's what these liturgies are doing for people. They're helping them to be predisposed, open to receive the cloud of glory. Mm. Yeah. 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 So here, maybe just to go back to our theme, because I want to just, I know we're getting near the end here. But look, I mean, we are going through a trial of faith right now. And so the question for priests, as us, um, and also for Doug, for you as laymen and all the, all the lay people, is that we've just got to make some decisions, personal decisions, that we're going to live this faith and suffer for it and be willing yes. to suffer it. See, yes. we don't want to suffer. We Oh, it's not fair. Okay, we can claim all that. But at yep. the end of the day, life isn't fair. And right now, the fact that we are hammered on because we're traditional and other people who are completely, I mean, just outright professing heresy are welcomed, it's not fair. But still, we're going through a crisis. That's what the catechism, yep. I think, is saying to us. And we have to say, well, okay, but full steam ahead. And if I have to yep. suffer... And I, if I have to be canceled or whatever, oh, so be it. Yeah. Now, we're going to be prudent, but by gosh, we're going to do it. So yeah. we're going to live this faith, and we're, we're going, it will test the faith of many. But test, having your faith tested doesn't mean you fail the test. Don't right. fail. And that's, yeah. I think, the yeah. ultimate trial that's going to shake our faith. It will shake the faith of many, but don't let it shake your faith. Yeah. You stand firm in the faith. Date in fide. Stand firm in the faith. And do not give way, and you're going to suffer. I promise you. Yeah. Jesus, I mean, I'm not, Jesus told us that. You know, they, if they've hated me, they're going to hate you. Uh, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Yeah. I called you out of the world. You're not supposed to be like the world. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway. Hey, family. Monsignor, that's a beautiful place for us to conclude. I want to just do one last pitch for 
everybody to join us. It starts August 15th, Novena for Our Nation. Uh, you can find all the information at usgraceforce.com. Also, too, I, I, this is an inspiration, another inspiration I've had, but if everybody please would join me, I'm, what I, here's what I'm doing, and I'm handing out these business card size cards. I don't know if with the glare you can see this, but it's the Prayer of Surrender by St. Ignatius. And I, it's just an amazing prayer, but the last line is what's what's amazing. Give me only your love and your grace that mm -hmm. is enough for me. Um, if we can get to that place, I think that's when the cloud of glory comes down and we just experience the presence of God like we've never experienced. And then the hunger begins and then wanting to do it his way, wanting to know him more, wanting to, to, and then to be that bright light of joy and peace and consolation to everybody around us. And we got to surrender. We got to surrender. So please join us for Novena for Our Nation with tens of thousands of people. I think we're going to get up to 100,000 this year. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then October 7th, uh, plan on the Rosary Coast to Coast. And if you can join us out in Washington, D.C., uh, that'd be great, too. All right? All right. Awesome. But, uh, Monsignor, could you close us with a little prayer of blessing? Yes, Lord, uh, we are in a great trial right now. And what shocks us most of all is not that we're persecuted from outside the church, but that often many we are many of us are persecuted from within. But Lord, you yourself suffered. You had a Judas, you had a Peter, but all your disciples in some way failed you, except perhaps John at that great moment. But Lord, uh, don't let us lose heart. Um, we Keep us faithful unto death. Help us, Lord. Save us. Have mercy on us. Keep us strong in our faith. Help us. There's a trial right now for our faith. Help us to pass that test, that trial, and uh, to uh, one day be welcomed by you. Help us to remember we will answer to you one day. And we only ask that maybe we could be among those who are among those who have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and um, have endured the trial of great persecution. So please help us, Lord. Now, may the peace and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit come upon one and all and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Beautiful prayer. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Monsignor. Thanks for being with Good. us again. Uh, Pick up your weapons now, everybody. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>